What's on, where, and when? It's the Talk of Nelson. Talk Nelson Radio. The Marco Rugby Roundup. Welcome to another episode of the Marco Rugby Roundup. I'm your host, Chris Butler, and as always, joined by my esteemed co-hosts, it's a, a new line I've brought in, esteemed, Les Edwards and Sean Davis. Thanks, Good Chris. to have you here, lads. Cheers, mate. Uh, we and our very special guest in the house, none other than Marco and Chief Centre Alex Nankerville. Great to have you here, mate. Thanks for having me on, guys. No worries. Um, let's dive right into the action this week. Our lineup is NPC Rugby, the Rugby World Cup, and also an exclusive chat with Alex about his rugby career, his time with the Chiefs, and also this season with the Marco. Our venue sponsor is O'Shedigans on Bridge Street, and if you're in search of the perfect spot to engage in rugby banter, or any banter of any any kind for that matter. We we accept all banter. You accept all banter, and I'm (laughs) sure there's plenty of it, especially around the poker tournaments. Um, O'Shedigans is the place to be, uh, so without further ado, it's time for the Shed Chat. Yeah, mate. We got, um, obviously, last week our our, uh, Warriors run came to an end, unfortunately, but we had a big crowd in for that. Uh, so this weekend we we shift our focus to that uh, All Blacks Italy game at at eight am eight am yes, Saturday morning. Yes. Yep. So we've got the um the breakfast lined up, the bloody Mary's ready, and um that'll that'll be us, mate. Saturday morning, big game on. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> get you going for the morning. <laughs> and I was listening on the radio this morning, and I actually missed the Dallium last night. I was was starting to watch the start of it with uh, the red carpet, but I couldn't couldn't cope with that. And then I. Heard the news and the Dalian winner is, and I was expecting Sean Johnson, yeah. and it wasn't. And it came down. <laughs> came, they they bought it. I don't know if you saw the the highlights of it, but they came down to the last game of the last round where they said to reveal it. And yeah, Sean Johnson was five points ahead, and Callum Ponga needed the maximum amount of points in the last game, and of course he got it. He so. got it. Yeah, yeah. And I think because those last two or three games, Sean was sort of running, not one hundred percent, was he? He had a couple of niggles. Yeah, so injury. yeah. Yeah. Okie dokes. All right, let's get into it. And it's the Bunnings Warehouse NPC. And boy, what a close game it was. Tasman Marco versus Canterbury. And uh, Alex, unfortunately, didn't make the full game, but um, had, had an injury, so he couldn't play the second half. But tell us your thoughts on the game, both playing and then from the sideline. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit of a niggly one to watch back because we just started really poorly. Um, we probably a bit flat. Uh, lost the collision, lost the game line, and uh, made too many mistakes. And you can't really do that against a side like Canterbury, who um, traditionally really well uh, do really well in the competition. So, yeah, second half made up for it. But um, I think it was same score in both halves. We scored twenty was it twenty seven points. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. Um, but yeah, twenty seven to thirty. It was there for the taking. Um, but yeah, we just can't start like that and let teams in. So yeah, so that was that was the thing, wasn't it? That um, your captain said after the match that uh, you know we we can't give a big lead like that. But what a second half, what a comeback, and and almost got there. So a big rev up from the boys. So I guess that gives the guys heart when it comes potentially down to final games. That um, if you could play that for the the full eighty, you've got it there. Yeah, hundred um... percent. And we might need it coming into the quarterfinals and things like that. But I think like it gives us confidence, but we've been building that confidence, I guess, the last kind of uh, six weeks, slowly being kind of on an up, uphill trajectory with our games and um, as we started a bit slow in the start of the season. So hopefully we just keep building and we can get that mindset right, But which is always a bit of a challenge to try to get 15 guys um, ready to go at the start of the game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely take confidence out of that. And um, unfortunately, you had to go off at half time and uh, a bit of a niggle. So I think uh, you were saying you thought it might have been... It looked like an ankle on the tally, but (laughs) a nank of a ankle, but um, no, a hip uh, nerve injury? Yeah, so hip uh, nerve compression in my hip, so pretty much just lost function in my leg and um, couldn't lift it. Like tried to, it wasn't sore or anything. Tried to get back into the D line, that line out, but I just couldn't lift my knee up. So had to get helped off the field, and then it was slowly, slowly came to. A couple of hours after the game, I was back to normal function, which was a bit frustrating because I couldn't really um, help the lads out there in the second half um, when I wanted to. Yeah. So it was like a pinched nerve or something that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah right. The, the, like common one in rugby is the shoulder stinger, or mm-hmm. like the nerve in your. And your neck, shoulder, kind of 
when you make a tackle gets compressed and you kind of get pins and needles down your arm. So I guess the easiest way to explain it is it's pretty similar to that. Um, but yeah, really, really bizarre injury. Like the physios and doctor haven't seen anything like that right. um, in rugby. So weird. Yeah. And thank goodness uh, able to, you know, bounce back and wean it out. So nothing too serious. Yeah, no, it's really good. Um, at the time, I was thinking the worst. I thought I'd done something really bad. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, last season at Tassie, that would have been a real shame if it was to put me out for a while. And then also going overseas, which is a really exciting opportunity for me. Um, that kind of can make things a bit sticky if you get out there injured and um, potentially yeah. put the contract on the line. So, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm pretty pretty stoked and relieved that it's just minor. Good stuff. I saw the second half, um, not so much the comeback. <laughs> it was more when, uh, you know, I, I just, I guess, caught the, the last part of it when it was, um, what was it? Yeah, it was 27 28, was it? I don't think there was any points when I was watching it anyway, but um, it was pretty close. And, um, and so, Les, you, you saw the whole game. What, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, it was just a, a slow start by the Marco, and unfortunately, they got on a bit of a roll. Um, they scored, Matali scored one try that shouldn't have been allowed off a, a line out. He was clearly inside the 10. Uh, that just uh, furthered their momentum. Um, at half time, clearly uh, the coaches and the team leaders said the right things because, uh, you know, the, the, the boys came out and they did win that second half by 15 points to three. So yeah. well done with that turnaround. And and I don't think the, the, that the Marco need to fear Canterbury. I saw yeah. that in the preseason at Hanma Springs and, and, you know, when they got it right in this game. Um, yeah, if you meet again, I, I'd really be confident that uh, Tasman can get up. Did you happen to catch the game? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, I, I remember when we had uh, Hugh on earlier and, and even Levi last week talking about um, just getting those basics sort of sorted first. That line out struggled for the first, well, first half probably. We lost a bit of ball there. And um, yeah, you don't need a lot of opportunities for Canterbury to, to score points. But um, yeah, I think the, the upside is that. You know, Canterbury probably got that lead because of the mistakes we were making rather than something they were doing. And, you know, once we got it right, we really showed that we're probably good enough to beat them. Geez, sure. the defence has been pretty torrid this season, hasn't it? And certainly uh, that last part of the game, both teams were really hammering each other. When they, there was not a mo- lot of space to get through. Yeah, well, the conditions changed a lot, eh? Like it was pretty overcast at the start, but dry, uh, no wind, and then it started to kind of drizzle a little bit at the end of the game so when that happens obviously it gets a bit tighter but yeah our defense has been awesome this year like um Heine mcdonald's done a really good job the last few years so and canterbury just good structures both sides of the ball so um they were trying to close it out and we we're trying to play so it was like just building phases um and it was wet so we couldn't really get around them and get to get to branches like we run into brick walls so so i noticed that with the rugby world cup and international football and watching mpc but just the the defense is uh, so good these days and you being in the centres you know how do you find those gaps and and you know how do you go about making those decisions you know they always talk about playing in front of you and one of the frustrations with me was when Barrett always kicks or tries to <laughs> kick it and he doesn't quite get it right when he does get it right of course he runs away with it you know but there's that thing do I take the gap do I pass it do I kick it so in, in the centre for you you know you've only got a, a quick time to make those decisions but with the defense being so strong these days you know where do you find the gaps uh, that's a good question i guess against every every team it's a bit different um and how you preview teams is really important these days because of because of the fact that defenses are so good um but i guess like as a midfielder you, you pretty much just got to sit really early and um like you said play what's in front of you get your eyes up um and then just play the space like we've got really good shape at tasman um that's kind of come from Leon McDonald. We still play the same way um, a few years ago, and that actually creates a lot of space for us. So there's little things and you can find in defenses um, if they're missing like a, a fold or their midfielders get stuck on the same side. All those little things, if you can identify them, you can actually um, break down defense quite easily. Um, it's just all pretty, the hardest thing is just being all on the same page with the backs around it. Is there a bit of pre-prep with watching who you're going to be potentially lining up against or is it um, more of a case of just 
looking for those opportunities when you're on the pitch? I think it's a bit of both. I think when you know the cues and know what to look for, then it's easy. Um, I guess I'm lucky. Like I played a lot of rugby consistently the last few years, so you kind of get a hit feel for the the pictures you're going to see and body shapes you're going to see, um, and what you need to actually get the ball into that space. So, uh, but it is a lot of pre prep. Like we like watch a lot of clips. Um, the coaches do an unreal job setting the boys up to for what we might um, come across in the weekend. So then we can just balance that with playing what's in front of us and then what they've um, previewed for us. One of the clips you might have seen after the game would have been uh, Tane Robinson tackling the ball with his head. Uh, <laughs> that was one hell of a falcon. Uh, is he okay? He played the whole game. He yeah. had, I, I thought he was going to go off for sure. Yeah, I was, we were a bit concerned though because obviously Mitch Hunt and we've had all the we've had just a ten crisis this year in terms of injuries. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, so when he kind of heart sinks a little bit, like his Tane's been going really well for us this year, and um, for that to happen pretty early in the game, we're like golly like yes i um, mean hunty even came down and warmed up with us so he was like the backup just in case anyone got warm- oh, into the warm-up yeah and then it would just been classic if um <laughs> i went down in the first 10 minutes he must and... be a tough rooster though because he shook it off yeah um, he's a tough man he's, yeah. he's from collingwood so. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> we're talking about the collingwood water <laughs> yeah that's right and interesting with mitch because we're just waiting for the start but um do you think we're, he's far away or no nah, he's not far away at all um i don't know if we can Oh, won't yes. say anything. No scoops. <laughs> no scoops. So <laughs> no yeah. yeah. You'll get in nah, trouble with the marketing back. department. Who's that? Um, soon. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, that's, oh, that's nice good. to see. Yeah. All right. So it's off on Sunday to take on Bay Plenty in Tauranga. So what uh the uh the Bops going to bring to the party? Yeah. Um, they've got a pretty good team, like all over the field. Uh, X Factor backs that you kind of are pretty unpredictable about what they're going to do. So um, you just got to be on around kind of all facets of the game. They've got like an awesome loose forward chair and a hooker, Kurt Eklund, who pretty much plays like a loose forward. So um, again, like we talked about it last week against Canterbury, if we win the breakdown, then it goes a long way to putting them under pressure and creating fast ball. And um, that's when teams struggle with us, with our shape and our, our backs we've got. So... Um, yeah, it'll be a good game. Um, they've got some really good guys, so it should be a really good challenge for us. Yeah, they've always played with intensity. Did Both you watch them him last night? No, I missed last night. Okay. I, saw, I saw the result, but missed yeah, the game. They, yeah, uh, they, <coughs> Southland nearly got up over yeah, them. Yeah, so yeah. you're getting them at the third game of a storm week, yeah. um, which is the second time you've been able to catch a team on, the, on that. Uh, how do you think that will impact them? Yeah, I think uh, it's a tough one because obviously the boys will be there's a few guys in there that have played most games this year. Um, going three games and I think it's eight days is it's pretty challenging. Like I was talking about it after hour one, we should probably get rid of it for <laughs> the players' sake because the amount of injuries you get. But yeah, they'll they'll obviously probably won't have done much training. Um, wouldn't have done been out of prep as well as they could have for us. But I think playing Tasman, um, we've been good the last few years and we know a lot of the boys in that team. So they'll definitely get up for it mentally. It's just whether they can kind of hold that the whole game so hopefully they can't <laughs> <laughs> but, but also the mindset can't be to take them lightly either is it because you know we know from that northern game that the word was perhaps the mind wasn't quite in play and they were on song and you know um it was a good result for them wasn't it so yeah so it's hard to know isn't it because some people uh, some teams respond to that hard hard grind when they're going into finals they sort of build momentum and they like playing week in week out and other teams yeah they need that break um so yeah well the, you know they're always a strong side so it's not going to be easy an absolutely yeah. critical game for the season for the marco so in fourth spot uh they are plenty uh you know the win will probably secure fourth spot and a home uh quarter final so yeah best wishes to you guys and i hope you have a great right. training week yeah uh and a uh, fizzing when you get up there. And uh, we're going to clarify things, aren't we? <laughs> yes, because there was a bit of a bit of discussion around the finals format, but you've dug deep, yeah, very, uh, deep. very deep. <laughs> and um, and and I, I was mucking things up a bit with the NRL format, uh, yeah, you know, rest weeks for the top two, and but it's not that at all, is no, it? No, no, it's uh, quarterfinals, so the top four play at home. And uh, thereafter, it's a straight knockout. So uh, semi-finals, finals. So, you know, make the top eight and you've got a chance. 
So I haven't got the table in front of me. I don't know who's eighth or who will end up being eighth. Why could why, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. is it really? Yeah. Okay. But even that's up in the air until the final round, as it should be. Yes, right. Okay. So then they take on Wellington at home. Mm. Uh, have you guys played? Have you played yeah. Wakata this year? No, we haven't played Wakata. So have you seen much of them? Yeah, I have seen a little bit of them. How are they uh, traveling? Yeah, they're good side. Like, um, they've got a really good back line. Um, and they can, they're a bit like Bo Plenty, can score from anywhere. They play a really not good brand of footy, like, offloads and keeping the ball alive and just play the space pretty much because there are a lot of youngsters in the team but I think they've had a few injuries like Quinn Supaya got a concussion at the moment I think um, getting ramp playing in place of the Chiefs who's a really good NPC player um, for a young fella he's been out for a few weeks but they've got like Aaron Cruden and they're steering the ship yeah, right, so, yeah. um, they're a good side like they're young and they're just keen as to get out there um, okay. yeah so they tip up Wellington <laughs> Yeah, it's Wellington the... are gone for the, for the season. <laughs> all that work. <laughs> don't lose a game all season. You're out in the quarters. No second chance. No second chance. Do we like that format? Uh, I think I think it fits in with the format of the season. You know, with storm weeks and everything like that, it's all fairly condensed anyway. So, yeah, I guess everyone everyone knows at the start of the season. Well, you, you everyone everyone except us knew at the start of the season <laughs> <laughs> how it worked. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, see, we just focus game by game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how we focus. These guys are the same. They, they, Levi couldn't tell us last week how because he was just focused on the next game. Yeah, That's yeah, what we get yeah. told, and that we're the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. We so we've clarified that. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's straight quarters, semis, and final. There you go. Rugby World Cup and uh, the big news, I guess, Antoine Dupont. Is well, he's got an injury, but now there's uh, talk about him being well. They said the first masked man. I've, I've seen other players wear those shields, but um, but in a rugby world cup quarter final, well, you know, and potentially the... goes on to the final wearing the mask, yeah. the masked man. So he had a plate inserted in his cheek. Wow. Uh, so he's going through recuperation. So Jeez. Uh, then he'll play. Uh, that's how important he is, though, to the French setup. Like he's the best player in the world currently, and they just want him. Because, you know, imagine, you know, they lost their best first five, losing their best halfback. That's really tough in the 9-10 combo. So they'll do everything to get back, and he's a tough rooster, so I reckon Gee, he'll do it. How's that? Go. Okay, son, go on, straight to the operating table. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to turn you into the bionic man. And, um, yeah, how's that? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, obviously, you know, I think probably everyone wants to see him play because if you're going to go into a final against – what they're talking about, the best player in the world, then you want him to play, don't you? You want to beat the best. Um, but a great game, Ireland versus South Africa, that really lived up to being a World Cup class game. What an atmosphere as well. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it was, um, it was always going to be an interesting one. I, two, I guess at the, t- at the moment, the two best teams in the world going head-to-head. Um, but yeah, it was just Ireland are clinical. Eh? Like, they've got this under attack shape that played close to the line, short balls and whatnot. Um, they kicked really well too. So yeah, it's, it's a interesting world cafe, but it was, mm. it was cool to see Ireland go over the line. Um, I thought they were going to win it. So Yeah. But I mean, South Africa certainly showed that when they turn it on, um, they missed their kicks too. It was about six points or something. So that may have made, um, yeah, a difference for sure. But, uh, when that Ford pack gets going mm. and bursting yeah. out the middle, the big boys for sure. Yeah. But you know, I I um don't get many wrong, Chris, but I got this one wrong this week. So I thought the South Africa might have had enough to get it done. But yeah, yeah, Ireland really showed they're um yeah, they're gonna be really tough for anyone to beat this tournament, I think. Yeah. And they kind of like with their bomb squad against us, they bought the whole lot on, but they didn't do that this match. They sort of fed them in gradually and um it didn't say I d I didn't think it made much of a difference. Oh, it's a it's a tough Irish forward pack. You know, that Peter Marnie is a, an amazing player. And, you know, Johnny Sexton running the show at number 10 at age 38. <laughs> They're just a tough team. But, look, South Africa will be kicking themselves because Ireland had a malfunctioning line-out for about mm. the whole of the first half, right? They could mm. hardly get their own line-out ball. Um, and then, un- un- unfortunately, uh, you know, they didn't kick their goals either. So mm. they'll be kicking themselves. The rematch will be quite mm. interesting. But well done to Ireland because basically, uh, against all predictions, they they undid the bomb squad. Yes, that's right. Yes, they they used it. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. looking uh, fairly likely we meet them in the quarters. Yes, it, yeah, beat Italy and we're playing Ireland. So yeah, um, and uh, I watched a couple of 
uh, players talking about predictions uh, and they were talking about this potential lineup and he you know and they were saying we'll take your pick i mean south africa versus france mm. you know both teams are going so well do we prefer the all blacks or do we to prefer france i mean <laughs> you know they're both tough propositions and from france's point of view and our point of view same deal do we you know whether we take on ireland or south africa they're just massive games aren't they mm. Yeah, but it's one game at a time, and you just got to deal with what you're given, eh? And prep for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's on the day, isn't it? Because you know, sometimes you can have a blinder, and the you know you might have a blinder in the quarters, and then semis you only just scrape through. And the All Blacks have seen that when they've marched on, and uh, then you just hope you're on song for the final. Um, but obviously, the other big news was. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know if I, I I would have picked this just with their form. I I certainly didn't pick Wales to run away with it. That's for sure, forty points to six. But they obviously had a a great second half and they're starting to kind of build nicely. Gareth Anscombe, yes, yeah, so coming on as yeah. a replacement <laughs> yeah. for bigger. Yeah, yeah um, bigger than off. I thought maybe yeah. you know it might be in a bit of trouble. But... You did right, Sean. Kicked all his goals. Just Played yeah. beautifully with Set the ball the in hand. Well and... and he's coming back from injury, apparently. I heard Warren Gatlin saying, well, he's actually on the way back from injury. Oh, so. he, yeah, he had a massive injury last year in, in Six Nations. He missed that. So, yeah, no, it was just a, a poor performance by Australia mm. at the end of the day. Um, yeah, Australia were way full. And Eddie Jones and all of his talk has come to naught. Yeah, come to <laughs> naught. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's well, right. That Welsh team will be another, another tough proposition. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they'll get... Uh, Argentina or Japan, I think, in the quarters, and and then um, yeah, the winner of New Zealand Irish in the semi. So. Well, they've got a very good chance of making a semi final, haven't they? Mm-hmm. And you know they're building, and it's all about momentum. Um, so you, you just never know. So the, I mean, we won't get into the whole thing about right now. I mean, we, that's a whole podcast about Australian rugby <laughs> because <laughs> it, you know it. It w- yes, you please. You're not going ahead of <laughs> Big time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing is, is that you can point the finger at Eddie Jones. He's, he's, you know, he got it wrong. He should have had the mix. Obviously, that's obvious. But you don't know. Sometimes the young ones respond. But and he thought potentially, oh, look, even if we go out in the quarters or the semis, I'll probably still keep my job and I'll be able to, <laughs> um, you know, go back and and start building some things. Um, but, yeah, not to even make the quarters, that then uh, has a big question around those. And then it comes out that he was on the phone, uh, you know, with an interview for Japan, which he's denying. Um, so why was he doing that? Did he read the writing on the wall? But it, it's not Eddie Jones. It's, no, it runs a bit deeper, it's Austra- it? It's yeah, Australian, Australian, rugby, Australian yeah. rugby, isn't it, and what needs to happen. And they've been talking about this for years. Absolutely. Fish rots from the head. Mm. And... Uh, you know, the chairman and Rugby Australia and their board will have a lot of questions to answer. But as you say, that's another podcast. Yeah. Well, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about what's coming up Saturday, 8 a.m. And it's uh, really a do-or-die game for New Zealand. If they don't turn it on against Italy, then um, yeah, and we've got to win this. But um, complaint, complacency, beware. Yeah, no, I think I think the boys will be in tune, mate. They... um. Yeah, we've we've had our upset for the for the tournament, and we'll be right from here on in. <laughs> That's good, but no, we've always we've always gone fairly well against Italy. I think they've never beaten us. Uh, don't quote me on that. No, I, but no, um, yeah, look, I think I think the boys will be pre- they they know what what needs to be done, and I think they'll um be more than prepared. And a very good team they've named named yes. this morning a, a, a rock solid twenty three. Um, you know. As a Tassie boy, I'm a bit disappointed that Jordan's not at 15 and Leicester's not at, on the wing and and uh, David Hillavilli's not at 23. Yes. But, you know, the selectors have chosen what I think is a really good team. Great to see Shannon Frizzell from the Marco back at six and Tyrell Lomax from the Marco uh, making his comeback from that uh, injury off the bench. So mm. a couple of Marco boys in the mix and, uh, yeah, looking forward to this one. But, yeah, I've got, I've got the uh, All Blacks winning this. Um, easily by you know bonus point territory. So your thoughts? Are, have you seen the lineup yet? Or yeah, I have actually. Yeah. Um, same as Les. So it's nice seeing the Tassie boys in there. But yeah, I thought um, Ethan might get a crack. Yeah, the, I know. Oh mate, he's one of the best loose forward in the world, I reckon. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, good to see Nani back in there. Shannon, he was awesome. Um, and was it June, July mm. test? Yeah, when they yeah. played South Africa, he was yeah. 
MVP for that. So he added just the, the physicality of the game, that go full ball that the boys probably need at the moment. Mm. Um, the attack seems to struggle, but uh, yeah, I read that Jason Ryan really disappointed that Shannon's not sticking around um, at the end of the season. He's off to Japan, but he'd love to have him in his forward pack for the next couple of years. So that's a that's a high compliment from from uh, Jason Ryan. I thought. Yeah. So uh, Kane back now. He's not starting though. He's on the bench, isn't he? So um, you know, I thought maybe a good opportunity just to see how Ethan goes. Maybe he'll because uh, there's no. Do we have yeah, got well, one more after this? Yeah, yeah we do. Uruguay. Uruguay. So maybe they'll they'll give him a run, but whether they'll throw him into a quarters against Ireland, start off the bat, that you know I'd expect him to be having a bit of a run here. But maybe it's uh, the All Blacks have sort of always rewarded those that um, you know have been the incumbents yeah. until they really fall off the perch. But I, you know, in my mind, I, I would have loved, you know, in my mind, I I'd still want Artie at seven. I'd love um, Ethan at six. And um, or or sorry, uh, either Ethan at six or eight, and Frizzell either at six or eight. Um, th- that's my preferred. I noticed Whitelock on the bench, um, so Barrett's starting with Brody Retallick. That might be just to keep the old boy. <laughs> you know, one hundred and forty nine tests. That <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Crazy. That's a hell of an effort. So <laughs> it'd be interesting to see where they start um, Whitelock against Ireland. Uh, whether they have Retallick and Whitelock and then bring bear it on or whether they do go you know they use one of them i don't know who um as as an impact um and then my disappointment is barrett at 15 i uh, you know uh would love to see well there and leicester on the wing uh i and who knows whether things will change but this <laughs> kick out of your own 22 straight to them it just puts your whole team under pressure and this whole kicking game i'm but I don't know. Uh, it's McLeod. Is it? Is it McLeod that is the? Oh, don't know, he, Ian a Foster coach, is yeah. the attack coach. He's the attack coach, right? Mm. But it's McLeod that's talking about the kicking game, isn't he? Mm, don't know. He's made quite a few comments about the kicking game, um, and uh, it, it worries me that we are doing these up and unders, and we're not doing what the French did to us, and you know, uh, you know, put it for territory. Um, but we'll see how we go. So. Again, you know, tell us a little bit, bit about the kicking game, what coaches tell you in the back line. You're the up and unders, the 50-50s, those kind of things. What, what's the idea behind it? It's not something I guess we see a lot of with the Marco. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, that Ireland-South Africa game, which would have been ripe for kicking, it wasn't a whole no, heap of no, it. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously changes a lot, but you probably watching our games were very um, contestable, focused around um, kicking from nine. So we'll just try and set it up, slow the game down so we can get our chase line on. Um, and the aim is pretty much to get the ball back or put pressure on them through um, messy ball, ruck ball, so we can get line speed off the line, um, error in the air. Uh, so it just depends kind of how you want to play. And we've got really good pay out of that. Probably not so much this year, but the last few years, um, especially 2019, we did it heaps, got massive pay out of it when we won that comp that year. Um, but yeah, it, it all depends really. Like I know what you're talking about around Bowden Barrow. He's kind of putting those aimless kicks in that aren't contestable. So yeah, it's a balance. Like you've got to get it up and bet someone get on the ball um, or you've got to put it behind them, make them turn around, make their big boys turn around um, and put them under pressure. But um, yeah, everything's a little bit different. Um, like we yeah, but I, I just don't think you can kick those kind of ones around halfway and give the French the ball back. Yeah, you're a massive full pack, and you're not turning them, turn mm. the big boys around. They can just stay, mm. stay around the halfway. And so. if they start their their back start getting a sniff, you know, and they start throwing that ball around. Watch out, you know. Yeah, interesting. Okay, and the other interesting thing is Fiji versus Georgia because if Fiji <laughs> win, Australia's definitely out. Yeah, and uh, and a lot of support I think in New Zealand for this Fiji team. You know, absolutely hoping that they make the the, the playoffs. Um, and they are a very good team this year. Um, you know, that combination of European players and and Fiji and Drua, they've melded into a really good team. Mm. They've clearly got some good coaching. Um, so yeah, I clearly want them to win. Aussie out, that would be terrific for both Fiji <laughs> and. <laughs> New Zealand. Yeah. Oh, well, it'd be great to see Fiji go through for sure. You know, and who knows in the quarters, you know, you just don't know, do you? 
uh black ferns and yeah i mean this is probably a little bit under the radar because of everything else that's going on but uh they've got a tournament happening in new zealand at the moment and uh they take on Australia and Hamilton, 4.35 on Saturday. That would be a great game. Absolutely. And I, I just wanted to talk about it to give a shout-out to Janelle Strickland, of course, who's yeah. uh, making uh, a debut as the Black Ferns uh, manager. Uh, so we had Janelle on the show, and, mm-hmm. and so we wish Nelly well. <clears throat> uh, and New Zealand versus Australia, they're always good encounters, and this will be on uh, – on Sky at 4.35 on, on Saturday. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see if the Black Ferns put on their strongest squad or whether they're going to experiment. But some of the young talent coming through are looking amazing, phenomenal, you know, um, uh, really good. So, okay, you're with the Marco Rugby Roundup, and it's our great pleasure to welcome to the show Tasman Marco 128, Alex Nankerville. It's uh, great to have you on the show, mate. Great to have you here. And, um, you came to Tasman fresh out of Christchurch Boys High School in 2015 and played for the Marco at just 18 years of age. So what was that Christchurch Boys High 15 like? Yeah, it was actually really good my year. Um, we had Josh Mackay. He played for the Landers Canterbury. Um, he's playing in Glasgow now. Will Jordan, um, who wasn't peak Will Jordan back then, um, who's kind of in and out of the team. But we just had a really solid team. Um, I think more than anything, we just gelled really well. And um, yeah, we had an awesome year. We went top four, lost in the semi to Hamilton boys by one point, I think. Um, right. I missed the kick, which is <laughs> good. Like, you know, we're hanging on to that. Yeah, yeah, it still on. comes up. It's, yeah. <laughs> Heartbreaking. But um, yeah, it's an awesome slide. It was a really fun year. Yeah. Um, so we found out that you were born in Auckland, but not for very long. And you ended up in Gisborne. Yeah. So dad's um, by trade, he's a school teacher. Um, so he was at teaching at Gisborne Boys. Um, then he ended up doing some work in the vineyards and stuff because he's got the passion for wine. Um, and then, yeah, mum was pregnant and um, all of our extended family, so mum's parents and uh, sisters, brothers, are, were all in the North Shore of Auckland. Um, so I think they just must have thought it would been a bit easier with dad working to have a bit more support around kind of during labour and then the kind of week afterwards. Okay. So yeah. 10 days and then back down to Gizzy for yeah. four years of my life, yeah. So it just dawned on me that your only senior rugby club has been Stoke from Nelson. No, nah, that that's, that's incorrect. I actually played, um, so when I left school, I went to Lincoln Uni. So I was on the um, scholarship out there and I played, I actually, my first game of the season broke my ice off it. So I was out for eight weeks. Oh, okay. um, and then I played probably, I played, probably played about six games, seven games, played in the final. We won that. And then it came up to Tasman after that. But, and then I also played for um, Hotapu and Hamilton. Okay. But only handful of games right but stoke is a special club to you yeah i think i'd say so like if I, was, if I was going to go to a club day or something in terms of like we have them in the team where you wear club jersey would be be a stoke one i don't actually have one but um it would be that <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. the stoke, there needs yeah. to be a red jumper yeah. coming this way it's cool. <laughs> yeah. interesting um, so, uh, so 2015 mate fresh at well Fresh ish out of school, playing midfield for the Marco. What was the background behind um, coming to Tasman rather than Canterbury? Yeah, so I've I've kind of always um, like you're a rugby player, right? You want to play rugby, so I've always kind of wanted to take opportunities where I'm going to get the best chance to actually get on the field. Um, and at the time, oh, not at the time, but just Canterbury being Canterbury and the Crusaders' influence, like they've just got so many people there that come from all over New Zealand, and then just also locals that have got this massive um, depth chart um, so kind of you kind of look at it and you're like oh I'm probably not going to play with the level I want to and I think I can at the age that I probably think I could so um, that was a big one um, and then obviously kind of getting towards the end of high school you kind of start to figure out rugby and um, but bit about the structure and um, things like that and watching the Marco play and just the way they played the game I was just like, that's kind of how I like playing the game. Just attacking footy, just playing what's in front of you um, and just it looked like they're having fun. So, yeah, came up, had a visit and um, Dad actually taught with Tony Lewis, the old CEO at Christ College. Oh, right. Um, and then, yeah, it was pretty pretty easy from there, really. Good from there. Was it, was it a fairly noticeable jump in, in terms of um, class or um, challenge between uh, club rugby and NPC? Yeah, I think... Um, the speed of the game massively. Um, 
obviously everyone's a lot more well drilled so the games are f- just fast and especially my team cup um they just play and um that's probably what i struggle with around my habits in the game um i wasn't ever the fittest bloke kind of my last few years at school because um, i had this massive growth spurt i was like 96 kgs in the last year of school and never really liked fitness um <laughs> back then um so that was probably the hardest thing like the physicality was fine it was just the being able to keep up with the game and when you're not kind of probably in the best physical shape in terms of fitness you can be you miss a lot of things on the field um just like that stuff i talked about mm. like playing what's in front of you um being able to sit early and see pictures and it was all just kind of you're just you're catching up to the yeah. game rather than um being ahead of it so that was probably the biggest challenge yeah, yeah it makes sense eh? Uh, that year, the the team made the semi finals. Unfortunately, going down to Auckland. Um, what was your recollection of that campaign, or or any um, of the the players that you were playing alongside? Yeah, it was an awesome campaign. Oh, um, Dave Avili, young young fellow back then, Pete Samu, Shane Christie, Joe Wheeler, um, Alex Ainley, uh, uh, Jimmy Cowan, like all these kind of nice. legends who I've watched growing up. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was pretty. It was pretty surreal to be honest. Um, I was a young fella and I didn't really expect to play much rugby that year. Um, just kind of learn off those guys and um, hopefully the next year kind of set me up to play some games. But it was a good season. Um, to be fair, I don't remember a lot of the rugby because I only had like little five minute cameos or ten minute cameos here and there. Um, I do remember that semi final in Auckland though. We got absolute hiding. Uh, <laughs> they were that twenty fifteen Auckland side was unreal. Um, and then I remember Dave Davey did his shoulder in the first half, so I've ended up playing 60 minutes, marking George Myler first, <laughs> first year out of school. Um, so that was that was a good experience. But, yeah, it was probably more the, the stuff outside of footy, like the connections and like all those guys love having a good time. So that was probably the main thing I remember from back then. Well, they are great Marco names, aren't they? And uh, Jimmy Cowan, that would have been interesting for an 18-year-old to, to be a sponge with that guy around. Shit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was pretty surreal to be fair. Like, obviously, Jimmy been in All Black and been playing a lot of games for the Landers. Um, it was it was pretty cool. He's he's a hard case man. Um, a few beers in him, and he's he's mad as a cut snake. But <laughs> no, he's, yeah, it was really helpful for me and my confidence as a young fella. Yeah, awesome. Um, so you're now in your ninth season as a as a Marco. And you're still just 26 years old. That's that's a very interesting thing. Uh, this Sunday, however, will be your 80th Marco match, uh, tying you with Joe Wheeler as the fourth most capped Marco in our history. Um, how does it feel to be joining one of the greats of Marco rugby in that honour? To be fair, I didn't even know before I saw saw your sheet, Les, and um, it's, yeah, it's it's pretty special. Um, I don't really see myself in that light. Like to me, those guys are still still the legends of this club and they probably set this club up from almost getting kicked out of the comp in 2011 to um what we have now what our culture is and the success we have on the field a little bit so um yeah it's pretty cool uh it's i i still think of myself as a kind of young kid um that's in the environment and just wants to have a good time with the boys and play footy but yeah it's pretty it's interesting how things change like when I thought I'd play even play eighty games with NPC footy, so um, yeah, it's pretty special. Well, it gives you motivation to make the uh, playoffs, doesn't it? Because <laughs> that'll put you into uh, fourth on your own. So, um, <laughs> but we'll give a shout out to Joey Wheeler. Yeah. Well done, mate. Yeah. You're, you're a legend. Um, obviously, uh, you've played some wonderful games in those eighty, and uh, some terrific memories. Your favourites? Um, can't go past twenty nineteen. That final, that whole season, really. Um, I guess like a lot of us started 2015, 2016, and we built really well um, through to that 2019 year. We had that was World Cup year. We had a few All Blacks back, like Jordy Tofua, Liam Squire. Um, so we had a really good team. White Crockett was there. Um, yes. And then yeah, just that was just a fun year. Like I guess if you guys heard about Tazzy, it's a lot of fun on the field, but it's a lot of fun off it. So like we did both, but we were winning. Um, really well every week um and then getting to the final like four i think it was a four o'clock game or five o'clock game it was just an unreal day packed out the whole the whole towns turned up and um to win against wellington for the first time in the club's history is pretty special so that one definitely sticks out to me 
Right, and and, and for me and, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a fabulous evening. Um, now uh, you proceeded by a season. The intake of 2016. Now, the, the intake of 2016 included a whole bunch of young guys who have built the success of 2019 and 2020, uh, guys like Mitch Hunt, um, guys like Will Jordan. So in a, in, are you close-knit with, with that group? Because you're all roughly young people, mate. Eh? Yeah, I'm v- yeah, very close um, with those guys. And I'd probably say they're some of my best mates um, that I have, obviously, living school at 18 Oh, sorry, yeah, you obviously leave school at 18. Um, leaving home, first year out of school, you kind of, I guess, disconnect a little bit from your schoolmates because you're doing everything with your roaming mates all the time and then those bonds really form. So, yeah, I've lived with uh, Quinn Strange, um, Dave Harvilli, Will Jordan, um, Rhett Finlay-Christie. That was kind of like a floating group that we've had before those guys kind of went on to hire on us. So, um, yeah, they're really good mates of mine and it's been pretty cool to see them uh Go do great things. Can you compete with them on the golf course? No. <laughs> <laughs> I only just uh, bought my own set of clubs a couple of years ago, and I've been on and off. I'll just go out when I'm when the body's feeling right. I've played more consistently this year, so the handicap's slowly getting down, but Jesus. The, not, some of those guys, are, they're really good. Eh? It's they're, not a second career then. No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> just a, fun, a guy man. like Will Jordan, <laughs> if he put his, head, yeah. his, his mind to it, he could be a terrific yeah. golfer. Him and Dave, I think they're both single digits now. They'll be probably... Um. Maybe around six handicaps. So I'm I'm still up above twenty. So long way for me. I might just play can hole golf. We know that. Guy. Like <laughs> <us>. <laughs> you want to join? <laughs> um, lastly, uh, in, we heard from Levi Amur who's on the show last week that you're you're a pretty tough taskmaster <laughs> on the field. Um, is that just your competitiveness competitiveness coming out? Yeah, it is my competitiveness, and I'm fully aware that I can be a bit of a, a bit of hard work sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've just got high standards. Like, obviously, this club's given a lot to me and given me all my opportunities, and um, especially the guys that have gone before who aren't playing the t- team at the moment. And I think I just want to see the club do well. So that's where it comes from. It comes from a place of care. Um, and then kind of the group we've got, I'm like the older or experienced guy now, which is mm. hard dynamic for me. And um, without Mitch Hunt being there the last few years, I'm probably the guy with the most voice. A lot of those guys in our team are a bit, uh, especially in the backs, are kind of a bit quiet and a bit more laid back than I am. So um, it's got it's kind of got to be done. But I think I probably push push the limits. <laughs> I do push the limits too much around my tone and whatnot. Um, so that's been a work on for me for the last few years. Slowly making improvements. So, uh, so you have to go and shake his hand after the game and. No, nah, no, nah, it's more. It's probably more <laughs> on the training field. Like, oh, so. game's not too bad, but um, yeah, yeah. Hey, they they know that it's just like a, I don't know. You end the head the battery in the middle of training. Like that's just how it comes out. You got to cheer um, up. Yeah, and yeah, it's just about being accountable to one another and um, making sure that we can challenge each other to be the best we can in, in that moment. Because um, instant feedback, I think, is invaluable um, to teams, especially in rugby. Yeah. Um, you use the word caring, and. Uh, I heard it from Ethan Blackadder in, in the team room once where he said, you know, deeply caring is what you've got to do in, in, a, in a team sport and if you want to be winners. And I think that it's really an important phrase to uh, to, to use, isn't it? Yeah, I, I reckon it's massive. Um, if you don't care about something, you're not going to go and leave it all out there or if you don't care about your mate next to you, you're not going to follow him into battle um, the same way you do as somebody you do care about. So, yeah, it, I think Teddy does a really good job to create that. So that's why guys like Ethan talk about it. You'll hear Dave talk about it all the time, Quinn Strange. Um, so they they build that care within us for what they've done for us and the connections that we have in the group. So yeah, I think it's massive, Liz. Yeah. 2017, you joined the Chiefs and, you know, you've done 80 games with the Marco, 70 super rugby games. So, you know, for 26, that's a lot of rugby. Yeah. You've, you've, you're quite experienced at such a young age. And you know, that's why I guess, well, Les is saying there's still a lot to come. Um, but why the Chiefs? Yeah, so there's a, it's a little bit the same as um, the Marco, really. Like I watched them 2013, uh, 2012, 2013, winning those games and just the kind of intent they played with, like the line speed was unreal, but they're also a little bit like Tasman. They threw the ball around. Um, it was exciting footy to watch. So I've always loved that kind of style of rugby. Um, and then Kieran Kane, who was my f- coach at Tasman in 2015, he went to the Chiefs that following year. Um, 
which was 2016. So he said, if you ever, like, I'll keep watching you, like, and I'll get you up there if we can, um, which is pretty cool. And then kind of after 2016 Tasman season, um, I probably had one of my better seasons that I've had for Tasman as a 19-year-old. Um, and then I had a, kind of a few different options on the table. So one was to stay at the Crusaders, uh, but how the contracts work, there's like a pre-season um, contract. So you, you're just there while the All Blacks are away, so two months. Um, one was actually a full contract at Western Force, and they um, actually went out of the comp the following year, which is quite oh, good yes, to yes. do that. Good decision. Um, and then... It was the Chiefs, but it was a replacement player for Charlie Nato. Uh, if, if you remember, mm. Charlie had a really bad run of concussion. Um, that kind of plagued them for a couple of years there at the Chiefs. So, yeah, I guess it was just the opportunity again, like I said before, to my best opportunity to get on the rugby field and play rugby is what I love doing. Um, so I don't want to be sitting around and training all the whole time. I guess it's probably a, a little bit extreme. Like you, There's obviously that development that you need and you're not always just going to go out there and play, but I thought that was my best opportunity. So, yeah, I ended up playing five games that year for the Chiefs, uh, 2017. So that was pretty cool. And then um, they signed me the following year and then the rest of history, really. You've been coached by uh, some awesome coaches. So talk us through a couple that have been probably the biggest influences on you. Um, Shane Christie. Um, I only had him for a few years, but he really challenged me, I guess, as a rugby player and where I was at with my game and then also kind of as a as a person too. Um, so he's been massive for me. I, I think when I was a bit younger, I kind of took it the wrong way. I thought he was coming at me and being hard on me. Um, but it was all just to help me and I think it just toughened me up a little bit around like he's people in this, in this um, game are just trying to make you better and... Um, that's what he was trying to do and I feel as though he made a massive shift in my game from I guess kind of being a passive uh, midfielder to quite um, I wouldn't say dominant but a lot more physical around especially on defense um, just a, and that change in mindset and once I figured that out I was away kind of um, running with it so definitely Shane Christie in terms of that like he's he's the man um, Andrew Goodman obviously Marco Legion he's He's great. He's a great guy. Like knows how to deal with everyone. Um, just really smart. Um, both sides of, in terms of technical and tactical. Um, so I learned a lot of him. And then uh, I had a little, little bit to do with Wayne Smith. He's kind of yeah. mentored me on and off a little bit for the last few years. Um, and just how he thinks about the game is, yeah, like you love to sit down with him. Mm. Um, he's a, just an absolute wizard around how he thinks about the little intricacies within the game. Um, so yeah, I guess like that was 2021 and I played a few years of super, that was kind of like the extra little percentages that you kind of need once you've kind of get to a stage where you kind of figure everything out a little bit. Um, so yeah, he was, he was a massive for me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And as far as players go, when you've gone onto a, a pitch and you've gone, wow, I'm playing with this guy or geez, this guy's blown me away. Yeah. Who are the players that have? sort of blown you away in the park and you thought, what an amazing player, I uh, guess, to play with. Yeah, to play with. Um, probably the first ones that stand out are like just the freak athletes. Um, Will Will Jordan, like how he does some of the stuff he does is just ridiculous, how he reads the game. Um, Lester, Mark Talia, when he played at Tassie, Jordan Tofua, like those guys, they're just freak athletes and you just would wish to have a bit of genetics like that. Um, but probably in terms of rugby sense, um, Dave Harvilli, like he's probably the most talented player I've played with in terms of his skill set, um, his game understanding, his mindset. Um, obviously, you've seen his kind of success the last few years and um, hoping that more to come for him and he can lock down that 12 jersey for the ABs. Um, but he's awesome. And then guys like Quinn Strange, Mitch Hunt, Finlay Christie, um, you just always know what you're going to get with those guys. Um, they leave everything out there. Every game they play for Tasman, there's never a game where um, you kind of question, I guess, what they're going to bring. So probably the, them for Tasman. And then the Chiefs, like Amani Narawa, he's just just a freak. Yeah. Um, Anton Leonard brown I've been fortunate enough to be in a combo with him for yeah, yeah. quite a few games. So um, he's just calm and he's the same as those other blokes I mentioned before. He just does his job every time. Um, so you always know what you're going to get. So 
yeah. he's certainly shown that in his run on, you know, I guess as a replacement player in the All Blacks. But man, you're not missing much if you pick him in the side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm a Sam Kane knocker more recently. <laughs> Perhaps not so much when he was behind Richie McCaw, but he's had a bad run of injuries. And more recently um, with the All Blacks, I, I, you know, my feeling was that um, he's not doing the business and we, we need someone else in there. Yeah. So that's my perception. And I'm not the only one with that perception right, yeah. or that idea. But there's something about him that the coaches see. And you've played, you know, um, underneath him, him as captain of the yeah. Chiefs. And actually had a pretty good super season, yeah, I thought, as well. Him. So tell us about Sam Kane. Yeah, Sam's, Sam's a, he's an awesome guy. Um, his just ability to like connect with the players is is really good. Like, um, I guess it's not always in like a verbal way one another. But no, because he's not very extrovert. Like you know, yeah, when he's not. getting interviewed, he's not very extroverted, is he? And you think you know you you want, you want a bit more out of him, but obviously there's something else there that uh, you know people respect. Yeah, well, obviously what he his actions is probably the main one. Um, and you just you've, I've never ever seen him like flustered or. Um, rattled in in big moments he's always calm and it has a really big effect on the group when you're kind of under a bit of pressure to be able to like just feel that from him and um it settles you down too but like i think yeah it's a, it's a hard one like he, i feel i feel for sammy because he's got such a hard time the last few years i guess it comes with a job a little bit being all about the captain but i think oh you you guys probably understand rugby a little bit better than most that are giving him a hard time but a lot of the people that don't know like if you watch him play, like he does so much work mm. that you just don't see. It's like the arrival mm. at the breakdown, like um, his collisions in the tackle, um, his presence on defensive breakdown, like, all that stuff that isn't fancy. Like he's the guy that's doing it. Um, so he was the player of the year, the Chiefs this year, and uh, deservedly so. But yeah, it's sometimes hard because people don't really, he's not going to score tries and make breaks or beat defenders. But it's all that little stuff that's actually massive for the the team's success. So a bit of like a Reuben Thorne, you know. He well, no better, he was, better, better. <laughs> well, better than Reuben. But but he he was the same, wasn't he? He would just do that hard graft, and yeah. and there was a lot of respect amongst the players. I think every team needs a player who's the glue, mm. you know, who holds it all together and 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 connects the yeah. team. And and he comes across to me as that guy, that uh, you know, he will just do all of the small things that you need done and that's not flashy yeah and presumably he's putting himself in there because the amount of times he you know he's been injured especially around the neck area so obviously he's going in there no uh yeah. not protecting himself at all yeah i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing eh? but his mindset's just yeah just leave everything out there throws himself into collisions um hence why you see those kind of shoulder and neck he's always getting up like not moving his neck running back <laughs> yeah, to that that's line right. um but yeah it's a bit of a balance, eh? his longevity, and um, yeah, there it goes. You're not a flanker, and you're pleased <laughs> nah, about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I don't have a mindset like that, eh? Because you can make some good shots, but you get hurt at the same time. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It'll be smart, <laughs> uh, mate. You've had had the honour of wearing the black jersey a couple of times for the Mary All Blacks and All Blacks Fifteen. How much did you enjoy that the cultural side or aspects of being in the the Mary All Blacks and and learning about your fucker papa? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, to be honest, like I, um, quick story. My dad's adopted. Didn't know who his birth parents were. Um, then we ended up finding it. So and he's always identified as Maldi. So, um, we always kind of knew. And then I guess getting in there opened that doorway for me to learn about my fucker papa mm-hmm. and the Maldi culture, which is really special. Um, for a guy that just had no idea about it. Um. So it's it's re- it really cool. Is every time you play and you pull the jersey on and do the haka, like you just get this. It's like you're wearing this um superhero cape, eh? like you just get this knotted yeah, bullet, cool. um set of armor on, and um yeah, those games that I played, I've always felt like the the best I've been mentally in terms of like just being dominant and um, my intent's been really good, and I think that comes from that learning about that stuff and the reason why and what the the jersey means and all that yeah. that kind of carry on. So um yeah, I ended up finding. My dad's, I did a DNA test because I've been intrigued for so long and found dad's um, kind of immediate family who are all around Bay of Plenty, Rotorua, um, which is pretty cool. So yeah, that like, also gave me an opportunity to do that. So, yeah, it was, it was really, really special, yeah. That's cool. Any um, standout moments you, you remember from, from on the field? 
Um, it was probably my game against Samoa. Um, like, because in those games, you're not really playing for a title or anything or a trophy. You're just trying to play mm. exhibition games or tests, I guess you'd call them. But um, that game we played at Mount Smart, Mount Smart Stadium before the All Blacks um, 2021. And I probably just played the best game of rugby I've ever played mm. in my life. I ended up breaking my jaw. I got smoked and broke my jaw. But I think that just one stands out just because... I was able to kind of wear, wear that jersey and perform and, um, yeah, make, make my family proud, I guess. Yeah, nice. Uh, you went on the, the All Blacks 15 Northern Tour to Dublin and London last year and Japan this year. Um, how eye-opening was, was those kind of tours? Yeah, I think just the level of, um, like, just level rugby just keeps getting better. Like, Super Rugby is a really good level rugby. Um, but then you've kind of taken those the kind of cream on the top and putting it together and um, it just goes up a level in terms of the intensity of the game the speed of the game again the collisions are all a lot faster um, and harder so it's just like I guess it was a good opener to see what international rugby could be like um, it's probably not going to be like you're not going to be able to figure out what playing against South Africa would be like from those games but just a little taste was pretty cool um, the campaign was because it's so short it was hard to like um just be so dialed into rugby the whole time so probably didn't really get the taste of that but like it was an awesome balance like just learned a lot around having some of the best coaches in New Zealand come together and um Liam McDonald Scott Hanson Clayton McMillan so just learning and yeah it was really yeah it was an awesome experience getting to travel away too is pretty cool yeah nice yeah. <laughs> um yeah so once you were selected for that um All Blacks 15 which I guess is effectively a backup for the All Blacks squad was there any indications or discussions at that time at, at, at just how close you were or, or opportunities to to look at progressing to that um, international level? Yeah, they it's it's hard because they don't give you a whole lot. Yeah. Um, but kind of the last few years, I've had indirect communication from the coaches to the Chiefs coaches around areas of the game that I can kind of maybe fine-tune a little bit or focus on. Um, and then this year, I had... Same same communication and then had catch ups with like the nutritionist, um, the doctor, um, and things like that. So you kind of get a feel that you're kind of in the mix. Yeah. Um, next cab off the rank, but yeah, never enough to know yeah. exactly what's needed to get to there. Which is which is, I guess it's hard, but it's probably how it should be. Like a little bit like they can't tell these guys that might not be involved with it where they need to be. Mm. So they're focused on their team and their campaign. But also, so. I guess they've got one eye on making sure they've got some backup. So if injury does come to play, you're ready to go. Yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's why I guess they kind of get those little details around where we're sitting nutritionally, um, how the body is, and then giving us an opportunity to play at a higher level in terms of those Japanese games and the games in, um, in the UK and Europe. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a good pathway. It just... You know, Makes guys like myself, I guess, who potentially kind of almost there, um, let them know a little bit more where they sit. Because mm. um, it's always been hard and probably entices us to stay in New Zealand a bit longer and um, help the player pool. But mm. A lot of people would suggest that you're one of the finest midfielders running around in New Zealand rugby and maybe next year would have been your chance. But you made the decision to join Munster uh, and have signed with them to play in Ireland. So uh, who approached you and, and what influenced you to join the Red Army? <laughs> um, yeah, so I was actually there in the end of 2021. Um, I was off contract at the Chiefs um, after 2022. And they the coach then was some South African bloke. So they just get in touch with the agent because um, they obviously have a list of players that are coming off contract. And they got in touch with them, had a Zoom with them. And then the head coach actually got, I think he got sacked. I'm not sure he got sacked or moved on or took a job at Bath. And then the other guy that was on the Zoom, Graham Roundtree, who's yeah. been involved with the British and Irish Lions yeah. a little yeah. bit. So you might know his name. Yeah. Um, he's the head coach now. So he was on that Zoom we had in the end of 2021. Um, turned out that I wasn't quite ready. I wanted to give it another crack um, to um, chase that dream of playing for the All Blacks. Um, and then... I guess after last season and AB's 15, and I was like, oh, actually, I'm pretty keen to go after my next Chiefs year. Like, you, I kind of put a few things together. My age, I'm kind of past that hump of 25 and 
kind of coming down potentially. Um, but <laughs> he's, only, he's only 26. <laughs> in terms of like, he's only 26. <laughs> In terms of, too long. In terms of a I'll show you our birth certificates, <laughs> and then and then you can say whether you're on the downhill slide. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I mean in terms of like <laughs> playing career. Um, yeah. And I've always like I've always wanted to go overseas. Ever since I figured out like the opportunities that we have as rugby players to do that, um, so I thought like I'd rather do that while I'm still running around pretty, like it's kind of peak of my game. And I want to contribute, like yeah. that competitiveness we talked about. I want to contribute to a team rather than just going over there, taking a paycheck and just hanging out and doing some travel. Like I actually want to immerse myself in the group and give to the group and learn a new environment, learn new rugby. And, well, I mean, yeah. the way Ireland are going at the moment, you, you know, you're going to be picking up some, uh, you know, plenty of knowledge over there as well. And also, it's not the end of the road just because you go overseas these days. I mean, people go over to Japan and play a couple of seasons, then come back. You know, um, you know, and you're only 26. There's still, you know, uh, plenty of time. So you, you never know. You know, never you know, just yeah. never know. And yeah, um, you got to take those opportunities, don't you? Yeah, I, I really like your answer, though. I think I think the fact that you are going to be 27, you're still at your prime. You can really give it a good shot mm. uh, when when you do get to play with them. But that, that, that's that's typical of Alex Nankable, which is great. Um, you're going to be the only Kiwi in the squad, but uh, clearly there's a, a couple of other big names that uh, excite you as well. Yeah. Um, only Kiwi, which would, be, which would be quite cool, just get fully immersed in the Irish culture. But yeah, they've got RG Snyman, um, John John Klein, John Klein. They, I think they're the South African lot pairing. Um, so they play for Munster. Connor Murray, probably mm -hmm. one that stands yeah. out, the halfback. Peter Mahani, the Irish captain. Um, and then it's just some other kind of young Irish players that are scattered around the team. So um, it's an exciting, they won it last year. So it's pretty exciting. Um, they've got a good squad. His coach seems like he's a good man and um, real passionate about seeing Munster do really well. So yeah. You're cool. going to have no shortage of line out ball. No, hopefully not. It's good for the backs. <laughs> but I don't know if how big a part the weather will play into that. I might not get past the first set of hands. So, um, well, yeah, that would be interesting too. Wet weather gear, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, skins. Alex, you're very close to your to your family. Um, can you expect to be seeing your parents, Kim and Fiona, and your brother Hugo over there in uh, in Ireland? Yeah, um, it's already confirmed. Um, Mum and Dad, so they they had a vineyard and they just got rid of it, um, and so they're going to come over. And do like I think it's is it woofing where you yeah. like work? Oh yeah, yeah, with, yeah, um, yeah. You just get free food and accommodation yeah. for doing work on the farm. Yeah, yeah. 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 So they're going to do that. Oh, yeah. nice. Um, do that in Ireland. I think they found a place just down south in Ireland around Cork that they're going to come over in November and do that for a few months. So they'll be there huh. um, pretty soon. I, I would have been settled in, and it'll be good to have them there looking after me. Um, and Hugo's <laughs> actually um, so my older brother. He's moved. He's done the whole European kind of travel around, see everything. He was doing that for a couple of months and he's just um, landed in Island, uh, London um, trying to find a job and trying to find a flat, which is probably quite tricky for him. So, yeah, we'll probably be all over there in uh, yeah. Christmas time and have a family Christmas. So it'll be good. Wow. How's that? Uh, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it would definitely help. Um, obviously, Ireland's on the other, other side of the world. So, we help having that kind of support network close. Well, a shout out to Kim and Fiona. I know they're good people, mate. So, we'll be enjoy that time cheers mate appreciate it well Alex we really appreciate you coming in mate and um, we want to wish you all the best of game for Sunday against uh, the big boffers so it's going to be a great game wish you luck and of course securing that top four playoff for the playoff uh, campaign so we wish you all the best at going to that and of course getting um, things in order and packing the bags and off to Munster so that's going to be a fantastic experience for sure yeah. and who knows we may see you back on the shores yet and and um, there'll be a spot in that <laughs> midfield. And uh, twenty more games, Alex. <laughs> oh yes, and Les wants the uh, the hundred. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You got to come back Imagine for the hundred. Well, there's yeah. two two carrots, aren't there? There's either twenty more games for the Marco, or five years, and you can play for Ireland. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> got to weigh it up. Eh? Low, lower, you'll be on the phone here saying, "Come on, yeah. man, come on." Yeah, awesome. Oh, it's exciting times ahead, and uh, we, you know, thanks very much for coming in and sharing all that with us, and uh, we wish you all the best Cheers, for guys. the future. You having me on? It's good stuff. Uh, all right, lads. So another big weekend. It doesn't stop, does it? So it doesn't stop, mate. You cooking breakfast on I am, mate. Saturday morning? Saturday morning. Yep, you've got the twenty dollar big breakfast. It's getting um 
fairly famous this breakfast. Is that it's, words getting out? Is words that... getting out. It's starting to spread. I might have to um, bring on some extra chefs. I think. But is that... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We're lining up outside. <laughs> so we'll open um, seven thirty a.m. Saturday. Yeah. And then um, yeah, we'll push right through. I mean, it's great this World Cup, but it, it makes for um, big days in Hospo. But um, we carry on right through Saturday night as well. So we don't, oh, right. don't shut at three a.m. We stay open for the five a.m. game, and then. Yeah, so we get we get pretty busy around not, sure. not three much or four a.m. and um, yeah, not a lot of sleep, but that's all right. It's I'd rather be doing that than nothing, to be fair. So yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Good, it's good fun. So yeah, we'll be, we'll be around all day Saturday um, from early. I didn't even realize that um, Black Ferns game was on, so that gives us a good excuse yeah, in the yeah. afternoon and be a good game. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Yeah, looking forward to having a breakfast. Couple of Bloody Marys, uh, <laughs> and that'll be you done, Liz. Oh no, no, I'll then do some yard work and then oh, uh, get get uh, in front of a tally to watch the Black Ferns. Yes, but most importantly, uh, two o'clock yeah. on uh, Sunday, watching you guys run around, getting a, a bonus point win and securing a playoff. Yeah, that's a goal. Yeah, so it'll be awesome eh, if we can play. And, at then, home and week. then next weekend we can go over to Blenheim and and watch the boys play there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, awesome. All right, thank you very much once again, gentlemen, um, and thank you to our listeners. Keep those comments coming in, and we'll talk to you again next week. The Marco Rugby Roundup. What's on, where, and when? It's the Talk of Nelson. Talk Nelson Radio.